I'm especially happy to introduce our speaker, Mikhaila Nazarenka, who's joining us from the Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev. Dr. Nazarenka is an assistant professor in the Department of East Slavic Philology and Practical Information Studies in the Educational and Scientific Institute of Philology. His 2021 book, Beyond Kobzar, an anthology of Ukrainian literature, received the Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev Award. He's also the author of Buried on a Mound, Shevchenko in Folklore and Fake Lore, and Taras Shevchenko, The Critical Reception. He's published very widely in Ukraine, France, Poland, Russia, Serbia, and the United Kingdom. And she has annotated and edited Ukrainian and Russian translations of works by Susanna Clark, Arthur Conan Doyle, Neil Gaiman, Alan Moore, and Terry Pratchett. Um, in 2022, he was awarded a scholarship from Penn Ukraine, and his forthcoming book is titled Taras Shevchenko in Memoirs, a critical end edition. Um, after, after the talk, I will, of course, open the floor to questions and discussions, and we'll be taking questions both in the chat and on the screen. So just do what it takes to get our attention. Um, the topic of Dr. Nazarenka's presentation here today is one that is of especially acute interest at the present moment. The title is Ukrainian in Russian, the life and death of Russophone literature in Ukraine. Welcome, Dr. Nazarenka. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to um, give this talk and uh, to say something about the problem that uh, occupied my mind for a rather long time. For I'm uh, one of the Russophone members of the Ukrainian community. I published a book of stories in, uh, in Russian. Uh, but published in, here in Ukraine and Kharkiv. So uh, it's not an, uh, just an academic interest, it's um, the uh, ecological zone uh, in which I live, uh, or at least I have lived before the war. And uh, a number of um, problems, uh, theoretical and practical, um, uh, that are connected with uh, the Russian or Russophone literature uh, in Ukraine are uh, not only theoretical, they are the problems of contemporary Ukrainian culture. Uh, what it is, uh, what is it? Uh, is it only, can it be created in Ukrainian only? Uh, do the uh, Russian, Jewish, Polish, uh, Crimean, Tatar, and other parts uh, contribute to it? Uh, what is the difference between uh, the uh, Ukrainian literature and uh, Ukrainian culture and the culture of Ukraine, the culture of people that live in Ukraine? Uh, so uh, I uh, think it's time to uh give uh, a broad picture of the history of the ukrainian literature that was written in russian and yet it uh, remained the ukrainian literature the part of the ukrainian culture so uh the uh, topic of my talk is ukrainian in russian life and death of russophone literature in ukraine uh Theoretical problems first. Uh, Deleuze and Gattari uh, coined a term, a minor literature, uh, in their book about, about Kafka. Uh, the pro uh, question is, is Russophone literature in Ukraine a minor literature? Uh, uh, I'd like to remind you uh, uh, what sense what is the sense of um, this term? A minor literature doesn't come from a minor language. It is rather that which a minority constructs within a major language, a, a deteriorated language appropriate for strange and minor uses. The second characteristic of minor literatures is that everything in, this, in them is political. The third characteristic of minor literature is that in it, everything takes on a collective value. 
Uh, if we uh, look at Franz Kafka, we'll see the uh, Jew, uh, a Jew who writes in German while living in Prague, in uh, Czechoslovakia, in Czech uh, Republic. Uh, we can imagine a Jew that lives in Kiev and writes in Russian. A similarity will, uh, is obvious, but I'd say that the differences are even more important. Uh, the Russian, uh, the literature uh, written in Russian in Ukraine was never a minor literature. It wasn't a literature of a small community inside the big language, inside a, a big literature, big culture. It was an imperial literature uh, written in the language of the empire and uh, the literature that contributed to the imperial culture and uh, in some extent to the Russification of, uh, of the Ukrainian lands, of the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian culture. Uh, so uh, it wasn't a um, uh, lan uh, Russian language in Ukraine wasn't a language appropriate for strange and minor uses. It was uh, the language of power. It was uh, the language that um, uh, was planted in cities and uh, to the minor extent in uh, villages of Ukraine. It uh, wasn't a political language in a sense that it um, pretended that uh, there was no ideology behind it. And uh, it wasn't uh, uh, the works uh, written in Russian in Ukraine uh, didn't take on a collective value as uh, Deleuze and Gattari put it. Uh, it was a uh, language of the people uh, Russian, Ukrainian, Jewish, Polish, and so on and so on, that identified themselves as uh, members of the Russian imperial community or later of the Soviet imperial community, uh, even when they didn't put it in exact words. Uh, so I think that um, in 19th century and in the 20th century, and even in the beginning of this century, uh, it's uh, the, the Ukrainian literature that was minor uh, in Ukraine. It uh, may seem to be a paradoxical statement, but uh, really it's not. Uh, uh, it's the Ukrainian language uh, that was appropriate for strange uses. Uh, because uh, nobody in Moscow or St. Petersburg believed that it is capable to uh, do something serious and important. Uh, the Ukrainian literature uh, from the beginning of the 19th century was a political one. And indeed, everything in it was political. Uh, the act of writing in Ukrainian and uh, the act of translating into Ukrainian uh, works of, um, let's say, Shakespeare or Byron uh, was a political act, uh, not just aesthetical one. And uh, the Ukrainian literature uh, had a collective value uh, in that sense, in the sense that uh, everything that was done by a particular writer or particular composer or painter and so on, everything wo uh, had a, a value for the community. Uh, every uh, artist indeed uh, uh, saw his or her work as a part of the uh, greater process, the process of the forming of the Ukrainian nation. So uh, if uh, we agree with Deleuze and Guattari that uh, Kafka's literature was a part of minor liter literature in Prague, uh, the works of Russophone writers in Ukraine uh, were not and couldn't be uh, an example of minor literature. 
it was um, a part of the imperial culture and uh, the last 30 years, the years of the Ukrainian independence, um, were a transitional period in which the Russophone community had to decide what uh, they have to do with uh, their language, uh, their culture, and uh, how to uh, become a part of the uh, wider Ukrainian culture uh, or remain the part of the culture and uh, how to not, uh, how uh, to avoid the uh, marginalizing, how to avoid the marginalizing. Uh, for a start, we have to go back into 16th and 17th centuries when uh, the biggest part of uh, Ukraine uh, belonged to Rzecz uh, Pospolita, uh, to uh, uh, Poland. And uh, we will see that even in that period, the Ukrainian culture was multilingual and uh, multicultural, in fact. Uh, a lot of works uh, were written in Latin, in uh, Polish, uh, and uh, only to some extent, only some works uh, were uh, written and read and printed uh, in uh, two forms, or two or three even forms of the literary Ukrainian language. Um, they were written in Old Slavonic language or Church Slavonic, they were written in uh, so-called uh, simple language, uh, prosta mova, uh, a, a, a literal language heavily influenced by uh, Polish language. And uh, some texts were written in the vernacular, in the uh, language that was actually spoken by uh, the Ukrainians. Uh, the, literature, the Ukrainian literature uh, was written in five or six languages at least uh, at the time. And um, there was no direct connection between the language of the work and uh, the culture to uh, which it belonged. Uh, we can say that uh, the self-identification of the writer, the um, audience to which uh, uh, the writer spoke and uh, the context in which the, uh, these works were circulated and uh, read and appreciated uh, was the real criterion uh, of them uh, of the work. Uh, it is the Ukrainian work because it was written by uh, Ukrainian for Ukrainians and uh, on the topics that were important for the Ukrainians, especially uh, the, uh, it concerns the works of the church uh, polemics of the late 16th and early, early 17th century. And then in the 18th century, the situation changed dramatically. In uh, 1654, uh, Ukraine, uh, officially became um, uh, a vessel and later a part of the uh, of Russia. And uh, the, all the 18th century was a period of a slow integration of the uh, Hetmanshina, Hetmanate, uh, basically the Ukraine as we know it, uh, slow integration of Ukraine uh, into the imperial structures. And uh, it uh, meant that uh, all the variants of the literary Ukrainian language um, were doomed to become uh, extinct, more or less. Uh, it meant that uh, in the middle of the 18th century, uh, the Ukrainian writers uh, stopped uh, writing in the in prostomova in simple simple speech simple language uh, stop uh, stopped writing in 
short Slavonic language, and uh, the vernacular Ukrainian wasn't uh, uh, wasn't good enough, uh, wasn't uh, rich enough for uh, writing what they had to write. Um, and so the only language that remained uh, was the Russian language. And we can see that in the mid 18th century, even uh, the private diaries, even uh, the chronicles, even the private letters uh, are written in uh, Russian. It's a very specific Russian. It's a Ukrainian uh, variant of the language, but still it's Russian uh, nonetheless. Uh, we can uh, remember that uh, the problem of uh, the language was one of the most acute for the uh, Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian writers of, of that time. Uh, Grigory Skovorodá, uh, the greatest Ukrainian philosopher, uh, author of uh, philosophical dialogues, uh, poems, songs, uh, and so on. Uh, Skovarda tried to create a language uh, that uh, would be, uh, that would serve uh, for the all uh, East Slavonic uh, readers. Uh, it's based on the uh, Russian, uh, plus uh, Church Slavonic, plus uh, some Ukrainian elements. Uh, from the rhymes in of his poems, we can uh, definitely say uh, that uh, he spoke uh, the vowels and uh, of the uh, Russian language as it uh, was uh, as that they were, were Ukrainian vowels. For example, uh, he uh, rhymes the words um, that do not rhyme in Russian, but uh, they do rhyme if you pronounce them in, in Ukrainian. Uh, 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 Grigory Skovarada was the last uh, writer of the old tradition, the tradition that uh, was based on a um, literal language that could be found uh, in books only. He didn't try, uh, uh, with exception of some small poems, to uh, write in the language that uh, the Ukrainian people actually spoke uh, at that time. Uh, and, but still, his works are an interesting linguistical experiment. Uh, the experiment that went uh, nowhere, and uh, so the works of Skovoroda uh, were um, almost incomprehensible for the next generation of the writers, uh, for Taras Shevchenko, for example. And uh, the uh, rediscovery of Skovoroda happened uh, only a hundred years later, uh, at the end of the 18th century and at the beginning of the 20s, when uh, the Russian uh, historians tried to um, interpret uh, Skovoroda's work as a part of the Russian philosophical tradition, or, or even as the beginning of the Russian philosophical tradition, uh, while they are uh, firmly based on the uh, Ukrainian uh, philosophical uh, thought and the uh, uh, tradition of Ukrainian thinking. Uh, Vasily Kapnist, or Vasily Kapnist in Ukraine, uh, was um, one of the prominent writers of the Russian classicism of the uh, 18th century. Uh, and still, uh, he undoubtedly uh, thought of himself as uh, of the Ukrainian. Uh, he, um, his ode to slavery is a condemnation of the introduction of serfdom uh, in Ukraine, and it was uh, written uh, for the Emperor of Catherine the Great uh, in mind. And uh, his later works uh, were the translations of, of from um, uh, Latin poetry, uh, but the uh, 
landscapes of Italy are transformed into the landscapes of Ukraine. And uh, so the Kapnist uh, began the tradition that would be uh, very powerful in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, he uh, transformed Ukraine into uh, uh, some kind of uh, exotic land, uh, something analogous to Greece or Italy for the uh, German romantics or uh, like Scotland for the British uh, people of the Walter Scott times. Uh, um, the paradox of Vasily Kapnist is that he was firm Ukrainian patriot. Uh, maybe the last, um, um, the last Ukrainian who uh, thought of the independent Ukraine in the uh, 18th century, and yet his uh, works uh, were considered as a part of Russian literature because uh, they uh, belong to the tradition of the Russian classicism and uh, have little in common with the um, Ukrainian tradition of the uh, previous, uh, previous centuries. Uh, and and yet and yet um, his works became a part of the later tradition that tried to um, reconcile them reconcile them Ukrainian with the imperial uh, the local tra traditions the local patriotism with the imperial patriotism uh, so we can say that uh, in the late 18th century and the early uh, 19th century, uh, every major Ukrainian writer uh, had a double identity. Uh, they uh, thought of themselves as the local patriots, uh, and uh, but they were completely unable to see the uh, future of Ukraine in, in, uh, without um, Russian Empire. And indeed, uh, they had their doubts about uh, the very fu future of Ukraine. They thought that uh, the Ukrainian language, the Ukrainian uh, culture, the Ukrainian history itself uh, are already ended. Uh, the Ukraine is living her last years or decades um, at the very best. And then it will become just uh, another, uh, the part of Russia, just as Siberia or uh, the northern regions. Uh, and so we can uh, see this in the works of uh, several writers of the early uh, 18th century. Historia Russa Vili Mali Rasi, History of Ruthenians or Little Russia, is a political pamphlet uh, masked as the history of uh, the Ukrainian land, uh, written uh, some uh, when uh, written uh, between uh, 1790s and uh, 1810s. Uh, it is a, a, a a fine example of the local patriotism that I uh, told about. Uh, the writer or writers of this um, anonymous work tried to um, try to uh, stand uh, try, uh, to state that uh, Ukrainians have the right to stay apart from Russians. They have the laws, they have uh, their traditions, they are uh, the descendants of the Kievan Rus, and uh, yet they are uh, as uh, fervent patriots of the uh, Russian Empire as any, any Russian. Uh, so uh, then uh, this work became very popular in the uh, 1820s and 1830s, but it was published only in uh, 1840s, uh, just because uh, the interest uh, for the Ukrainian culture was uh, rather low in uh, Russia in previous decades. And uh, it is a um, uh, astonishing example of this double identity. Um, the 
writer of the uh, history of Ruthenians, doesn't want to uh, condemn Hetman Mazepa, who rebelled uh, against uh, Peter the First, Peter the Great, uh, uh, but uh, he can't glorify him too. So uh, Mazepa, um, in this work, Mazepa pronounced the patriotic monologues uh, that are uh, written just as uh, as if Mazepa uh, really said something uh, something like that. Uh, and then, uh, in after two or three pages of the patriotic monologue, uh, the uh, writer uh, says two or three words about uh, the low treason uh, of Mazepa, but uh, it uh, ra uh, rather uh, poor performance. Uh, it is obvious that um, the writer of the author of uh, History of Ruthenians uh, saw uh, the future of uh, uh, his land as a semi autonomous uh, province of uh, Russian Empire, but still a part of, part of empire. Uh, the uh, romantic interest in Ukraine and uh, as an exotic uh, land uh, that is part of the empire, but not. Uh, not Russia uh, and the, uh, the part that uh, retains some of the peculiarities. Uh, this vision of Ukraine was uh, very popular in both in Russian and Ukrainian literature uh, of the time. While Ukrainian literature of the first decades of the 19th century uh, could uh, consisted only of uh, three, four books. Uh, the, uh, it wasn't, uh, the literature written in Ukrainian consisted in, uh, of uh, three or four books, uh, but uh, many writers that were born in Ukraine and uh, considered uh, it as uh, their homeland, uh, uh, wrote about it in Russian and uh, for Ukrainian and Russian uh, readers. Uh, this is important because uh, this uh, double identity meant that uh, the senses of, uh, of the work, the ideology of the work, uh, differed uh, depending on who was reading uh, the book. For example, uh, Antoni Pogorelsky, uh, a Russian romantic writer, wrote a novel, Monastyrka, in which uh, he described the girl who uh, studied in St. Petersburg and then uh, returned to her Ukrainian village. And uh, for the Russian uh, reader, uh, it meant that uh, the educated girl uh, so uh, strange, cus strange customs, uh, strange ways of uh, those uh, those uh, peasants and uh, the nobles uh, that uh, are very like their peasants um, in their ways uh, and even in their clothes, in their speech, and so on. Uh, this is uh, how uh, Pogorelsky's novel was read by Russians. But if a Ukrainian reader opens the book, he finds there a, a satire of the Ukrainians who uh, lose their Ukrainian identity. Uh, it's uh, a work about the girl who uh, forgot all about her native land and uh, the way she describes uh, the customs of um, her neighbors is uh, absolutely hilarious just because she doesn't understand uh, what they're doing, uh, why uh, they speak like uh, that, uh, uh, why, what songs uh, they, uh, they sing. And uh, uh, for Ukrainian readers, and I believe for Ukrainian readers of the 19th century as well, uh, it is a work about uh, coming back to the national roots, coming back to the homeland and uh, the native culture, uh, the native land and the native culture. Uh, so uh, it is a situation very typical for the uh, 
uh, early uh, 18th century. Uh, the Russian readers read about uh, Ukraine and laugh uh, at, uh, at the expense of Ukrainians. And the Ukrainian readers read the same books and laugh at the um, Russian reception of, um, of the work. Uh, many of the Ukra uh, works were written in Ukrainian in that period worked uh, the same way. Uh, Vasily Narizhny, or Vasily Narizhny, as he's known in the Russian tradition, uh, wrote a number, number of books. Uh, some of them are dedicated to the Ukrainian uh, history and uh, the Ukrainian life of, uh, of the 19th century. Uh, it is uh, well known that Narizhny uh, had great influence upon uh, Nikolai Gogol or Mikola, Mikola Hochel. Uh, and for me, it is important that uh, all uh, Norwegian's books were, were published in Russia. And um, uh, for a simple reason that um, except uh, Kharkiv University, uh, there were just uh, uh, the publishing house in Ukraine was was simply unexistent. Uh, and uh, so uh, the image uh, of Ukraine as a romantic land, as a uh, idyllic land, and the land of uh, brave uh, Zaporozhian Cossacks uh, was planted into uh, Russian culture. And thus Narizhny um, opened the door for the later writers such as uh, Yevgen Hrebinka, Orest Somov, and Mikola Hovel. Uh, uh, all of these writers uh, lived, uh, were born in Ukraine, uh, knew the Ukrainian language rather well, and um, uh, only Hrebinka tried to uh, actually to write something in uh, Ukrainian. Uh, for example, he was the first translator of uh, Pushkin's poem Poltava, into Ukrainian. Uh, uh, why uh, this exact work? Uh, because it is about uh, it's about Ukraine, yes, and uh, it's about the uh, Russian patriotism in Ukraine. It's about um, Peter the Great's triumph over Mazepa's rebellion and over the Swedish uh, Swedish army, and so uh, it was. Uh, an example of work that proved um, Ukrainians, uh, the Russian patriotism, the imperial patriotism of uh, Ukrainians. And also it uh, proved, or rather Hrebinka tried to prove, that uh, it is possible to translate uh, uh, Russian poetry into Ukrainian without making it sound ridiculous. Um, Hrebinka wasn't very talented translation uh, translator, and his translation of Pushkin's poem uh, was rather bad. But it's the intent that uh, that counts. Um, uh, Rastomov wrote romantic stories about, uh, based on the Russian and Ukrainian folklore, and it's obvious that um, it. He didn't saw uh, any difference. Uh, he could uh, write about uh, the folklore of the Russian village or about the folklore of the Ukrainian village, and um, uh, it uh, was important for him that it is a uh, Slavonic folklore, no more, no less. Uh, Mikola, uh, when Mikola Hall came to Saint Petersburg in the late um, 1820s. Um, he uh, already saw there a small uh, but uh, very patriotic community of uh, the fellow Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, he saw uh, he, um, something more important. He saw the great interest in the uh, Ukrainian uh, folklore, in the Ukrainian culture. Uh, among the uh, uh, readers uh, of the capital of the empire. So uh, first Gogol's books, 
uh, evenings on the Hooter near Dikanka and Mirgorod, which are on the Hooter Blitz Dikanki Mirgorod, uh, uh, were the, uh, I'd say, uh, the colonial goods, the goods from the colonies. Uh, they described the uh, history, the folklore, and the modern life of Ukraine in terms that Russian readers could understand. Uh, uh, and what's even more important, um, the, uh, these books uh, stated that, uh, more or less stated, that uh, Ukrainian history is over. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, witches and devils and uh, fantastic adventures are in the past. Uh, uh, this Google story, uh, night, night Before Christmas, uh, uh, describes the voyage of uh, the blacksmith Vakula into St. Petersburg uh, at the same moment when the Zaporozhian Cossacks uh, arrive uh, to the Russian capital to ask uh, the Empress Catherine the Great uh, about mercy. Uh, they ask her to leave the Zaporozhian siege, uh, their, uh, their capital, uh, uh, to live alone. And as, as we know, uh, Catherine the Great didn't listen uh, and liquidated the Zaporozhian siege. Uh, um, so uh, Gogol describes uh, the event in humorous terms, uh, but the sense of the scene is, uh, is clear. Uh, the, heroic history of the Ukrainian Cossacks, the Barosian Cossacks is over. Uh, but the life of the Ukrainians, such as blacksmith Vakula, uh, um, continues. They just became the part of the uh, empire. Uh, they remember what they used to be, but uh, they are um, the part of the greater uh, entity, the Russian Empire, empire itself. Uh, it is important to remember that uh, Gogol was considered uh, at the time as a Ukrainian writer. Uh, when somewhat later, and even in nowadays, uh, there are discussions about uh, his national identity, and uh, Gogol uh, Told in one uh, wrote in one of his letters that he didn't know what soul, uh, uh, what kind of soul he has, uh, the Russian one or the little Russian one, uh, the Russian or the Ukrainian, uh, and uh, the question uh, uh, who can most right, uh, who has most rights on uh, Google, uh, the Russia or Russia or Ukraine. Uh, uh, whose writer is, is Gogol, the Russian or Ukrainian? Uh, it was a question that uh, never uh, arised uh, before the mid uh, 1830s. Uh, Gogol himself considered um, uh, himself to be uh, a little Russian, uh, Malaros, or Ukrainian. Uh, the, uh, that is a part of the greater Rus, Rus, Russia, uh, but Russia in the sense of Russian empire, not uh, the Russia as uh, um, motherland of uh, uh, the Russian people. The uh, uh, problem is, uh, it is easy to say in Ukrainian, but rather hard in uh, Russian or in English. Um, the Ukrainian language distinguished between <coughs> uh, Ruski, that belongs to Rus, uh, the Eastern Slavonic lands, and uh, Rusiski, uh, that uh, belongs to Russia or Russian Empire, or Russian Federation. And so uh, Gobel considered himself to be uh, a part of Rus, but uh, not of Russia, I'd say. Uh, and uh, but in 1835, uh, just three years, uh, four years after the publication of uh, Gogol's uh, first prose book, uh, one of the Ukrainian critics uh, wrote a rather harsh uh, 
overview of Ukraine of Google's stories. Um, he accused Google uh, of not uh, really knowing the uh, history and the culture of Ukraine. Uh, his uh, the critic um, Andriy Tsarin saw a lot of mistakes in Google's descriptions, and what's even more important, he saw. Um, uh, he saw Google as a Russian, not Ukrainian writer. Uh, this is the moment when uh, the question uh, arises. Uh, can the Ukrainian writer write in Russian? And why uh, does he uh, write in Russian? And what, uh, what does it mean to be a Ukrainian or uh, a Russian writer? So uh, for uh, Hrebinka, Som of Gogol, and so on and so on, uh, the double identity was something uh, natural. But uh, even in the mid uh, 1830s, uh, some of the Ukrainian uh, writers, critics, and readers uh, became to question that double identity. Uh, the romantic notion of the uh, national soul and uh, the language as uh, an expression of the national soul uh, demanded uh, to make a choice. And uh, in uh, 1840, Taras Shevchenko, uh, who uh, published his first poetry book, Kabzar, and made, made the choice. Um, he made uh, the choice to be a Ukrainian writer who writes in Ukraine. Of course, he wasn't the first one or even the 10th Ukrainian who wrote in his native language. Uh, for example, we can, um, we can mention uh, Grigory uh, uh, Kvitka, who wrote on uh, the pen name of Hritsko Osnovyanenko, uh, who um, in the mid uh, eight, uh, 1830s, uh, wrote some stories in Ukrainian uh, to prove that the Ukrainian language is capable to express uh, high notions, uh, delicate feelings, and, uh, and so on. Uh, these works were immediately translated into Russian, which meant that Ukrainian literature started to uh, drift apart from uh, the Russian uh, literature, from the Russian culture, because uh, previous works written uh, in Ukrainian were read in uh, Russia, but not translated. Uh, it uh, seemed for the Russian readers uh, that they can uh, they can uh, understand everything. That uh, was a mistake, of course, but, uh, and yet, uh, at the time, uh, Hritsko Snovyanenko's stories were read in Ukrainian and uh, translated into, uh, into Russian. Uh, but then um, Snovyanenko went uh, the way of many, other Ukrainian writers uh, went, uh, he started to write in Russian uh, directly. Uh, he didn't want to be translated. He wanted to be uh, widely read and uh, understood in uh, the whole of the empire. And uh, so he basically uh, practically stopped uh, written, uh, writing in Ukrainian because uh, the number of Ukrainian readers were, uh, was rather small. And uh, a lot of Russian critics, uh, including the most famous one, Viserion Belinsky, uh, thought that uh, those who write in Ukrainian uh, simply uh, uh, don't have the ability to uh, write in Russian. And as Grebinka tried to prove that uh, he can translate Pushkin into Ukrainian, so uh, Osnovyanka and uh, some of the later writers tried to prove that he can write in Russian uh, and um, be even more, more popular. And uh, it was a mistake too, because uh, his Ukrainian works uh, were uh, read and cherished and appreciated as uh, some exotic fruits, uh, 
but uh, his Russian uh, works were received uh, rather rather poor because uh, they were written rather poor, in fact. Um, here you see the portraits of uh, some of the uh, Ukrainian writers of the middle of the 19th century, uh, Mykola uh, or Nikolai Kostomarov, a famous historian uh, who wrote uh, about uh, Ukrainian history and Russian history, Pantolimon Kulish and Alexis Storozhenko. Uh, three very different uh, literary fates, uh, very different ways of expressing their love for Ukraine. For Ukraine. Kostomara uh, uh, wrote his first um, books of poetry in Ukrainian, and uh, he was the first translator of Shakespeare and Byron into Ukraine. Um, and then, uh, after he was arrested with Kulish and Shevchenko for the, taking part in the secret political um, organization, uh, Kostomarov uh, basically stopped writing in Ukrainian. For the last 40 years of his life, he wrote only in Russian. And uh, it's said, but the first translator of Shakespeare and Byron in uh, 1880s claimed that is, uh, there is no need of translating Shakespeare and Byron into Ukrainian uh, because uh, every Ukrainian um, can read them in Russian or in English or in some other uh, European uh, language. Uh, Pantelimon Kulish uh, wrote his first novels uh, about Ukrainian history in Russian, uh, but uh, then his second novel, Chorna Rada, The Black Council, about uh, the tragic events of the um, 17th century, uh, Kulish translated into Ukrainian. Uh, his aim was to prove that uh, it's possible to write a um, historical novel in the Walter Scott mode uh, in Ukrainian. And it uh, has a great, um, this fact that there is an Ukrainian historical novel um, had great influence over the next generation of the writers. Uh, the idea that you can uh, write about Ukrainian history uh, and uh, uh, meant that you can write about everything in uh, Ukraine, her history, uh, her present, and her, uh, her future. And uh, Alexis Storozhenko, uh, one of the uh, many writers who uh, tried to imitate uh, the Goebbels' fantastic stories, uh, started to write uh, in Russian as, uh, as Kulish, and then um, and then uh, his later books are uh, in Ukrainian, in Ukrainian language. And uh, the, one of his major themes, uh, one of his major topics is the contrast between the Russian life and the Ukrainian life. Uh, he uh, was a faithful um, servant of the empire. And um, you can see that in, in his books, but it is important that in 1930s, Osnovyanenko went from Russian to Ukrainian and then uh, to Russian again. Uh, Kostomarov went from uh, Ukrainian to Russian, uh, and Kulish uh, and Sorozhenko went from uh, Russian to Ukrainian. And yet, even uh, Pantelimon Kulish's later works, uh, prose works, are uh, written in Russian. Because, uh, as uh, he saw, uh, the number of the Ukrainian readers who are willing to pay for the novels, uh, stories in Ukrainian was rather small. Uh, it is uh, very characteristic, uh, the, very typical, uh, that the first um, Ukrainian a magazine, uh, Osnova, the foundation, uh, existed for two years only, and it was bilingual. Uh, and um, uh, the reason for such, uh, such short uh, term, life term, was uh, that uh, the Ukrainians, uh, the Ukrainian readers, uh, didn't buy the magazine. Uh, they uh, 
wanted uh, for the Ukrainian tax to exist, but they uh, were uh, not ready to pay for them. Uh, situation that was typical in our country even uh, 20 or 30 years, years ago. Um, it is known that in 1960, uh, 1860s and 1870s, uh, the imperial government tried to suppress uh, the development of the Ukrainian culture uh, in fear of Ukrainian separatism. Um, and so uh, such Ukrainian writers as uh, of the uh, 19, uh, 1850s and 18. Uh, 60s as Markov, Chok, Anatoly Svidnitsky, Danilo Mordovets uh, that started to write uh, in Ukrainian um, turned into Russian, um, turned to Russian language. For example, Anatoly Svidnitsky was uh, the uh, author of the first uh, novel about contemporary Ukraine, not about some distant past, but about contemporary Ukraine. And he proved that uh, you can uh, write about the modern times uh, with your characters uh, actually speaking in Ukrainian, not Russian. But his novel uh, was uh, published for a quarter of a century, just for the reason I've already told you about. Uh, nobody wanted to publish it because uh, everybody uh, was sure that nobody will want to read it. Uh, the complete novel, uh, a long novel, uh, written completely in Ukrainian, ridiculous. And so Svidnitsky uh, began to write stories in Russian, uh, rather unusual stories about the uh, Jewish mafia in Ukraine. And uh, they were published in Kyiv uh, newspapers and forgotten for more than, uh, than a century. Uh, um, we can claim, I can claim that uh, Nearly all the Ukrainian writers who um, worked in Russian and Russian context uh, in the uh, late uh, 18th century uh, were not considered uh, to be uh, a part of the Ukrainian culture. And uh, they didn't consider themselves to be part of the uh, Ukrainian culture. Uh, for example, Vladimir or Volodymyr Korolenko, who uh, lived uh, in Ukraine for the most part of his life, and a lot of uh, his works are dedicated to Ukraine, but uh, he, uh, there were almost uh, no links between him and uh, the Ukrainian writers uh, of the time, the Ukrainian cultural community uh, of the time. Uh, Karolenko and other uh, writers of the uh, late eight, uh, 19th century, such as Danilo Mordovets or Daniel Mordovtsev, uh, could, uh, could write about Ukraine, but uh, without the context of the uh, Ukrainian culture of, um, of the age. Uh, and only in the, uh, in the first decades of the 20th century, uh, we can see uh, the uh, movement in the opposite direction. For example, Pavlo Filipovich, one of the prominent Ukrainian poets and philologists and translators of the uh, 1920s, uh, started his uh, work as a, a Russian poet. He uh, belonged to the uh, Russian symbolist movements. He uh, sent his poems to Alexander Bloch to St. Petersburg. And yet after the uh, revolution of 1917, he became a part of the uh, uh, Ukrainian cultural movement and stopped writing in Russian, Russian completely. Uh, of course, there were some uh some works and some writers that existed on the border between the russian and the ukrainian uh, cultures for example um vasilis gnida uh, gnida or gnida um but in uh, 1913 published the first futuristic poem in ukrainian and uh, as 
uh, but published it in Russian uh, Russian collection of poems Nibakopy, uh, the sky diggers. Uh, as a good uh, futurist, futurist, Gnedov uh, declared his hate for all the previous culture. And in um, this poem, uh, his hate for the traditional Ukrainian culture, uh, for uh, Taras Shevchenko and uh, Kropivnitsky, one of the prominent Ukrainian dramatists of, uh, of the time. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the Russian or Ukrainian futurists uh, really hated hated Shevchenko. Uh, they hated, in fact, uh, the image of uh, the primitive uh, Ukrainian culture that was uh, connected in uh, the readers' minds with the uh, oversimplified understanding of uh, Taras Shevchenko. And it is uh, important to remember that in 1920s, uh, the Ukrainian futurists uh, be, uh, began to publish a number of works under the umbrella title The Rehabilitation of, of Shevchenko. They tried to try to, uh, try to uh, transform uh, the Ukrainian classical poetry into the futuristic poetry. And uh, Vasilis Gnedov is uh, one of these uh, borderland cases uh, because he's ob he obviously belongs to the uh, Russian tradition of futurism, but uh, the Russian tradition of futurism uh, was uh, deeply connected with the Ukrainian culture at the time and such uh, painters as uh, Kazimir Malevich, or Alexandra Exter, and so uh, on, and or David Burluk, uh, are considered now to be uh, the part of the Ukrainian culture as well as um, as Russian one. Um, uh, uh, it sh should be said that uh, a number of the Russian writers of the uh, 1920s or 1930s were born or, or in Ukraine. Uh, and they belong to the so-called South School or Southwest of the Russian literature, but still uh, of the Russian literature, not the Ukrainian one. Uh, um, I'd like to uh, mention just in passing uh, such writers as Zev Zhabotinsky, who uh, wrote in Russian, who belonged to the, uh, not to the Ukrainian, but to the Jewish and uh, Russian literary tra traditions, and other um, writers uh, that were born and raised in uh, Odessa or in Kyiv uh, or other Ukrainian uh, cities. Isaac Babel, Mikhail Zoshenko, Ilya Yevgeny Petrov, uh, Eduard Bagritsky, and the most controversial uh, figures of them all, uh, Mikhail Bulgakov. Uh, the paradox is um, another paradox, yes. Uh, Bulgakov wrote one of the best novels about about Kiev, but uh, the White Guard, Bela Gvardia. But it's obvious that uh, he had no sympathies for the Ukrainian national uh, movements, uh, for the Ukrainian independence, and uh, his characters uh, mock both the Ukrainian culture and the Ukrainian uh, the Ukrainian language. Uh, it is sufficient to say that uh, some of these writers uh, really have connections with, uh, with the um, Ukrainian culture. For example, uh, one of the, uh, Eduard Bagritsky's poems, Duma pro Panasa, a song about uh, Opanas, uh, is modeled upon uh, the uh, Taras Shevchenko poems and uh, the Ukrainian folklore. Uh, and sti uh, still, Bagritsky uh, continues the uh, tradition uh, that belonged to the previous century, the tr tradition of uh, introducing the Ukrainian culture uh, into uh, the Russian one, but not the uh, changing the boundaries uh, of the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian culture. Um, the same with uh, Isaac Babel. Uh, 
uh, his uh, stories, uh, the events of his stories uh, uh, take part in Odessa or in the Western part of Ukraine, but uh, no connection with the uh, past or present with uh, the Ukrainian literature can be can be seen. Uh, we can uh, I can mention uh, uh, two earlier Russian writers Nikolai Liskov and Alexander Kuprin. Both lived in Kiev. Uh, Liskov in the middle of the nineteenth uh, century, Kuprin at the end of the century and the beginning of the twentieth century. But uh, Liskov wrote about uh, uh, Ukrainian Kyiv, uh, among other things, and uh, Kuprin wrote about Kyiv as uh, about some, uh, basically, some Russian Russian town. And the Ukrainian element is uh, scar scarcely presented in uh, in his works. So uh, the same can be said about uh, Ilf Petrov and Zoshenko and Babel, uh, even if in uh, Ilf and Petrov's novel, The Golden Calf, uh, uh, one of the characters is the Ukrainian writer Yuri Yanovsky. Uh, and still uh, nothing uh, specifically Ukrainian uh, is present in their works, even when they describe uh, the Ukrainian Odessa of uh, 1920s. Uh, maybe the most important uh, prose writer uh, of the Russophone uh, literature of the 20th century was Viktor Nikrasov. Uh, the, uh, author of the famous novel, uh, famous in the Soviet literature, uh, In the Trenches of Stalingrad. Uh, he uh, lived the most part of his life in Kyiv. He uh, was a part of the Ukrainian uh, culture and Ukrainian movement. He uh, befriended a lot of Ukrainian dissidents. He took part in uh, their, uh, their actions, for example, for uh, in the uh, meetings in Baben Yar, uh, the place of the Holocaust in Kyiv, and uh, and yet uh, his uh, works, even those that uh, describe Kyiv, uh, don't have a real connection with um, the Ukrainian tradition. They are deeply Kievan in uh, in spirit. Uh, Nikrasov describes Kyiv in uh, all, all his, his glory and uh, uh, as a native place, as a place uh, that he's really, really at home. Uh, and uh, but even his friendship with uh, Ukrainian writers, critics, uh, and so on um, didn't. Uh, didn't make the connection between his works and the Ukrainian literature stronger. Uh, they basically existed in uh, the different um, different planes. Uh, the same can be said about uh, a number of uh, poets that lived in Ukraine uh, in the last century, such as Nikolai or Mykola Ushakov, Boris or Boris Chichibabin, uh, Leonid Vyshislavsky, uh, and so on. Uh, the uh, Ukrainian poetry written in uh, Russian uh, was at the time deeply traditional, traditional in the Soviet sense of the word. It was uh, rather simple. Uh, it wasn't uh, even trying to be experimental. Um, no word libers, uh, no uh, blank uh, verses, uh, only the classical forms. Uh, that go back to the Pushkin's Pushkin's time. Um, the, some of these uh, these writers translated from Russian to Ukrainian or from Ukrainian to Russian, especially Taras Shevchenko. Uh, some of them, as Chichibabin, uh, who lived in Kharkiv, in the eastern Ukraine, expressed uh, the deep uh, uh, deep uh, well, not fear, but um, mistrust into the Western Ukraine. Uh, Chichibabin wrote a poem about Lviv, the Western Ukrainian uh, city, 
uh, in which he uh, describes the city as uh, an alien one. Uh, the um, barrier between the uh, Ukrainian-speaking Lviv and mostly Russian-speaking Kharkiv was uh, so so impressive. So the uh, add so deep, it seems at the time, that uh, Chichibabin uh, felt himself to be a, stra uh, a stranger in strange land while still uh, on the Ukrainian, Ukrainian territory. Um, uh, there were a number of um, cases when uh, the uh, Russian-speaking writers uh, became the Ukrainian uh, began to write in Ukrainian, and the most uh, famous one in the modern Russian uh, Ukrainian culture is uh, Leonid Kiselyov, uh, a talented poet uh, who uh, started uh, to write poems rather rather earlier as a child, uh, but a child prodigy. Uh, uh, but then he uh, turned to Ukrainian themes, Ukrainian topics. Uh, one of his best poems is dedicated to uh, biography of Taras Shevchenko. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, to all uh, to li all who um, dare to oppose dare to oppose the empire. And then in his uh, last years, he died of um, cancer, cancer. When he was very young, uh, Kiselyov uh, began to write stories in uh, uh, poems in Ukrainian. And uh, as for now, he's one of the um, small number uh, of uh, Ukrainian writers who uh, wrote in Russian and in Ukrainian and uh, are considered uh, part of the uh, Ukrainian canon of the 20th, uh, 20th century. Uh, uh, most of the Ukrainian writers of the uh, 20th century uh, aspired to publish in uh, Russia, in Moscow or in St. Petersburg. It, uh, it was something of a seal of approval, uh, the publication in uh, the famous uh, Mo uh, liberal Moscow, uh, Moscow journals such as Novy Mir, New World, and so on. Um, of course, it meant that uh, their works uh, would be read but by a larger number of readers. Uh, it meant that um, they would be considered serious, serious writers. And uh, I, I'm afraid that uh, those who published in Kyiv only uh, were considered, uh, well, losers. Um, there was and there is a um, uh, uh, an old uh, magazine, a Kyiv magazine, uh, for uh, the Russophone writers of Ukraine. It's called Raduga, uh, the Rainbow. And uh, but um, though some of the prominent um, Ukrainian writers uh, published in there, um, a number of number of uh, writers, uh, a number of works that were published over almost 90 years of its existence um, were rather, rather poor. Uh, Moscow tried to grab uh, talented writers and published, uh, published it, uh, uh, them there. Uh, the uh, situation uh, could cha uh, change in uh, the age of the Ukrainian independence. And it changed, but uh, rather unexpectedly. Uh, first of all, uh, the main part of, uh, and the most popular part definitely of the Russophone uh, literature in Ukraine um, was uh, genre literature of the uh, 1990s. And uh, the, genre, uh, the fantasy genre, uh, became known in the post-Soviet countries uh, just uh, just before that in the late um, 1980s, and a number of the Ukrainian writers started to try this new genre, and um, uh, some of them even 
try to uh, describe the Ukrainian life and the Ukrainian tradition in this uh, this genre. Um, I can mention uh, some of them. Uh, Boris Stern, uh, the uh, author of the picaresque novel about the uh, adventures of African uh, chief uh, in uh, Ukraine uh, during the civil war and the adventures of the uh, Ukrainian boy in Africa uh, later later on. Uh, it is uh, a uh, carnival novel in the tradition of uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, uh, and uh, it um, it is. Uh, very interesting in uh, one in one way. It describes the Soviet and post-Soviet situation uh, as uh, um, it was seen by the Russian-speaking Ukrainian Jew, and all the elements are uh, are very uh, very important. Uh, it's a person who feels marginalized in every way way possible, and uh, who describes uh, the uh, marginal existence as uh, the basic form of the human existence. Um, more popular were uh, Dmitry Gromov and Oleg Ladizhinsky. They lived in Kharkiv, and they published and still publish under the pen name of Henry Lyon Oldie. Why, why so? Uh, it wasn't, uh, it was very hard for them um, writer of science fiction and fantasy to publish as a Russian or a Ukrainian writer in the 1990s. Uh, there was a great demand for the uh, translation from uh, English. And uh, so uh, it was possible uh, for the Ukrainian writers to pub and for writer, uh, Russian writers as well to publish their works uh, under the um, anglophonic pen, pen name. Um, and uh, the secret of this pen name was uh, soon discovered. Uh, it was obvious that Henry Lionaldi isn't uh, an American, but uh, but still the pen name remained. Uh, Marina Sergei Dechenko lived in Kiev, Andriy Valentinov uh, lived uh, in, in Kharkiv. Uh, they have some collaborations. Uh, for example, you see the cover of the novel, uh, The Edge. Um, uh, Dechenko uh, tried to um, establish a connection between the Western genre of fantasy and the Ukrainian tradition because they rem well remembered that uh, Mykola Gogol, uh, Mikhail Kutsubinsky, Lesy Ukrainka, and other uh, Ukrainian uh, classics, classical writers. Uh, used the Ukrainian folklore freely uh, way before uh, Yeats or Tolkien um, became uh, began to do uh, something uh, something like that. Uh, and uh, some of the Dichenko's works are uh, remakes in the uh, fantasy genre of the classical works of Ukrainian literature. For example. Uh, how would the characters of uh, Lesy Ukrainkas play the fourth song, or how the folklore characters from Mikhail Kutsubinsky's uh, story, uh, The Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, uh, how they would live, uh, would feel, how would they live in the modern Ukrainian, Ukrainian city? Uh, the uh, novel The Edge uh, that Oldie Valentino and Dechenko wrote uh, together, uh, is a very interesting attempt, very interesting, uh, not aesthetically, but uh, social, sociologically. Um, very interesting attempt to present the image of the Gogol's Ukraine to the modern Russian reader. Uh, they describe the Ukraine of the uh, late uh, 18th century with uh, all the mythological folklore characters imaginable, uh, but it is the uh, safe Ukraine. It's uh, Ukraine, uh, half independent Ukraine, but uh, in the borders of the Russian Empire. Uh, they have, uh, the, uh, Ukraine have its own hetman, but uh, he's subordinate to the, uh, to the Russian empress and so on and so on. Uh, 
So uh, the picture uh, of Ukraine that they created uh, was um, rather pleasant for the Russian for the Russian reader. Uh, Ukraine uh, remains in the end of the 20th century as exotic and as uh, 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 as uh, in the uh, 19th century, and uh, still it exists in the imperial, uh, political, and cultural space. Uh, all these writers uh, published in Russia, and they, uh, but they uh, were uh, rather popular in Ukraine uh, uh, as well, especially Marina and Sergei Dechenko. Uh, but um, one of the Dechenko's novel. Armageddon Home, a pun on Armageddon and Home, uh, Armageddon as uh, a state of existence, uh, describe uh, post-Soviet Ukraine as a place of uh, permanent catastrophes. And um, it is a very acute and uh, exact uh, depiction of the 1990s, of the first uh, post-Soviet decade, but uh, with one uh, tiny but very important exception. There is no national movement, political, cultural, and so on, uh, in uh, this fantastical version, version of uh, Ukraine. Uh, why? Because Dichenko uh, tried not to uh, move into political uh, direction, political fiction, and because it wouldn't be uh, understandable, it would be uh, uh, completely alien for the uh, intended Russian readers. Uh, that man. Uh, Sergey, I mean, uh, Mihala, I'm so yeah. sorry. I'm going to ask you to move toward a conclusion because I am getting messages saying there are questions because the talk is so sure, fascinating. Sure. And I just want to make sure that we leave time for um, for discussion. So um, thank you. I'm really moving. moving Great. Through. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, Mar uh, Dich uh, Dichenko and other, other writers uh, 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 remain the part of the uh, imperial cultural cultural process. Uh, in the uh, um, in the nineteen nineties, uh, there um, it was uh, a possibility that the Russophone Russian literature uh, will continue to exist, will form a part of the modern independent Ukrainian Ukrainian culture. Uh, in the uh, beginning of the century, uh, two branches of the uh, Ukrainian literature uh, written in Russian, liter uh, written in Ukrainian, uh, even began to uh, converge. Uh, there were uh, literary festivals in, uh, um, during which uh, poems and stories were read in both uh, languages. Uh, there were uh, a number of um, uh, magazines, uh, bilingual ma literary magazines, uh, and so on. And yet, uh, and yet, um, as for now, uh, there are, uh, Russophone uh, Ukrainian literature is almost uh, unexistent. Why is it? Except uh, the, uh, the war, of course. Uh, wh what are the reasons? Uh, some, um, the uh, Russophone literature, uh, Ukrainian literature, tried to describe uh, the uh, state of the uh, Ukrainian uh, of the of the Ukrainian culture St uh, the Ukrainian uh, state the, the Ukrainian independence the Ukrainian past and Ukrainian future uh, as uh, looked upon by uh, the people who are part of this land but uh, have a specific um, a specific point of view, Russophone uh, point of view. Uh, uh, but uh, in the 2010s, uh, it, beca uh, it uh, became evident uh, uh, that uh, there is no specific point of view of Russophone that, that is different from the point of view of uh, those who uh, write in, in Ukraine. Uh, the community of the uh, uh, Russophones and uh, the, those who prefer to read in Russian uh, weren't even remotely interested in uh, in such works, and so the most talented writers of the um, Russophone writers of the post-Soviet generation 
uh, Andriy Kurkov, uh, widely translated into uh, English and other languages, Volodymyr Rafienko, Alexei Nikitin, who uh, write about problems, uh, about the conditions, about the uh, prospects of the, mo uh, of the modern Ukrainian life. Uh, started to publish their uh, works both in Russian and in Ukrainian simultaneously, or moved into the uh, Ukrainian language completely. Uh, the main re uh, first of the main reasons is that uh, there is no Russophone community that feels the need uh, for the Russophone literature. Uh, in fact, uh, the second uh, reason is, of course, that uh, the um, ex existence of Ukrainian culture demands uh, uh, the use of the uh, Ukrainian language. Uh, the uh, Russian invasion uh, brought uh, Volodymyr Rafenko to the point uh, that when he uh, sworn not to write anything in Russian, uh, Russian again. Uh, the Russian language became uh, the language of the enemy, even if a uh, uh, considerable part of the Ukrainian citizens still speak uh, in Russian even, even today. Uh, but the, uh, as for now, uh, the Ukrainian culture still um, remains uh, multi, multilingual, uh, with a clear dominance of the Ukrainian language uh, for the first time of uh, in uh, three uh, last three hundred uh, hundreds of, of years. Uh, uh, there are, and I think the, there will be uh, for some time, uh, writers who. Uh, write in Russian because it's their native uh, native language. But uh, all the, uh, almost all the writers who uh, were born in the late 1970s or early 1980s uh, and who started their write, uh, writer's career in Russian uh, uh, now uh, are writing in Ukrainian and uh, or even they uh, write in Russian, they do not publish their original versions, but uh, the translations only. Uh, what is the future of the Russophone Ukrainian literature? Um, I don't think that it is bright. I uh, named the uh, this talk the life and death of the Russophone literature. And I, uh, I think it is where it uh, makes, makes its way. Uh, the you, uh, literature can't exist if there is no uh, need in it. And uh, I think the um, time when uh, the Ukrainian uh, readers feel the need to read about themselves in Russian or uh, the need for the Ukrainian writers to write about uh, their land in Russian uh, is ending or has already ended. Thanks a lot, and I will be happy to answer to your questions. Mikhail Hazarenka, thank you very much for that extremely illuminating talk. Um, it was fascinating, and I'm sure that we have questions. I see the question of uh, Robert Romanchuk in, in the chat about the uh, little Russian literature over the uh, Goebbels time as uh, minor literature and uh, I think it's a very uh, profound and useful uh, addition and correction of what I, what I have said. Uh, obviously uh, the problem of the uh, existence of little Russian literature, Malaruska literatura, uh, of the uh, 18th uh, th century can be uh, the topic of uh, a long, long talk, and I had to uh, simplify uh, to simplify matters a little. Thank you. I actually have a question um, while we're uh, dealing with technical issues, and this is a little bit of a theoretical question. Um, my sense is that. Uh, minor literatures, not so much in Deleuze and Guattari's sense, but in the sense of sort of literatures that are labeled provincial, right, which Ukrainian literature sort of is by by Russian critics in the 19th century. Um, 
one of the one of the kind of big tests is is it allowed to aspire to seriousness and highness without being silly right if you're if you're provincial as soon as you start to be as you start to be serious and high that's when you become ridiculous and that's when everyone makes fun of you right what when do you see i'm just curious to see when i assume in the 19th century um ukrainians like push back ukrainian writers push back very successfully against that perception you know like somebody like Belinsky would think oh to try to be high in ukrainian is ridiculous right when does the successful pushback start against that idea in fact uh, it started even before belinsky in the uh, late uh, 1820s in kharkiv uh, the uh, kharkiv romantic uh, romantics uh, started to uh, write and publish uh, ballads lyrical poems uh, and so on and uh, then a decade later uh, customarov's translations from uh, English from English literature, uh, but uh, the uh, real game changer was uh, Shevchenko, of course, and uh, in uh, when he started in 1840s, uh, uh, Belinsky was uh, definitely uh, di uh, didn't consider him uh, Shevchenko to be a serious serious poet, but in the early 1860s. Uh, the uh, situation changed. Uh, Shevchenko had a uh, reputation of martyr after he spent 10 years as a soldier in the Tsarist army. And uh, the number of uh, uh, writers who started to uh, imitate Shevchenko or uh, write um, uh, complete uh, original uh, stories and poems uh, after Shevchenko um the sheer number of these writers meant that uh, the Ukrainian literature uh, couldn't be ignored. Although, uh, for example, Turgenev was still uh, was rather skeptical skeptical about it. Uh, I'd say that uh, at every turn of the of the history, uh, there was a number of uh, Russian readers and critics who were deeply interested in uh, Ukrainian literature and a number of those who uh, didn't uh, believe in the possibility of, of its existence. Even in uh, 2013, when I was last time in Moscow, one of the uh, Russian, Russian critics asked me, uh, well, uh, how can anybody read Les Ukrainka just for the pleasure of it? He, uh, they, uh, he and uh, the likes of him uh, still thought in the 21st century that you can read the Ukrainian literature only as uh, a duty or uh, in the school program and so on. Uh, so in, uh, in a sense, uh, the... Um, the last turning point was uh, some years before uh, before the Russian invasion, when uh, Sergei Zhadan, the prominent uh, modern Ukrainian writer, was published in uh, the Moscow magazine, The Foreign Literature. Uh, the, uh, they, uh, at last, they uh, uh, thought that Ukrainian literature is, is foreign. That is very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, Igor, are you uh, ready to unmute yourself and ask a question? How's your connection? Uh, first of all, I would really like to to, to say thank you to Mikhail Nasarenko. It's uh, it's a pleasure to hear from you again, and it's been a while. Uh, and the lecture is really uh, illuminating. Thank you. Uh, and I was a bit concerned about the topic on uh, Grigory Skoroda. Mm -hmm. You said. Uh, uh, Russia has um, misappropriated the tradition of Skoroda and um, like to, to make him his own public figure, uh, which is definitely not, which is definitely not. And I was uh, curious on what, what grounds could they uh, appropriate them, him to, to, to call him uh, a Russian traditional uh, public figure um there were several several reasons uh, 
Third, uh, the first one, the most important one, maybe, uh, he lived in the Russian Empire, so he's Russian. Uh, the second one, uh, the language of Skoroda is uh, uh, very close to uh, the Russian language. And uh, if we uh, see the um, a number, a percentage of Russian words uh, uh, in his his works, uh, it's uh, really uh, greater than the percentage of the Ukrainian words. And the third reason was um, Skovoroda was very important for the uh, Russian philosophical tradition, uh, that uh, the figure that introduced uh, the Ukrainian tradition into the Russian philosophy was Pamphil Yurkevich, a Ukrainian philosopher that, uh, who taught in, uh, in St. Petersburg. Uh, and uh, so uh, if uh, Skovoroda is so important for the Russian philosophical tradition, he definitely must be Russian. Uh, and uh, one more example, rather starting uh, to um, uh, the, um, uh, some years ago, uh, works uh, of uh, Fefan Prokopovich, the Ukrainian and Russian political figure were published in St. Petersburg. It was uh, a uh, his lectures on poetics that he uh, wrote in Latin and read in Kiev Mohila Academy uh, at the beginning of the 18th century. And uh, it was published as a, a milestone of the Russian aesthetic uh, tradition. Uh, it was. Um, of course, Prokopovich made a huge impression on the Russian tradition of the 18th century, but uh, his works didn't belong to it for, uh, when he wrote it. Thank you, Mikhailo. Let's actually, before I ask my question, I see a hand from Elena Gapova. Let's go to Elena. You want to unmute yourself and ask your question? So I have this question about the use of the word Ukrainian. Well, and I was thinking about this use, usage throughout your talk. You said that, well, at a certain point, Ukrainian was a part of Poland. I know what you mean, but well, this is a part of my question. In, uh, and you are speaking about early modernity. Then you speak of Ukrainians in the Middle Ages, in the imperial period, in the Soviet periods, and these are different matters. And then you refer uh, to, to works written in Polish, Latin and Russian and other languages, and you define them Ukrainian. Although, well, I don't know how their authors might have thought about themselves. So what is your common signifier in this usage? And I'm asking this question because I come from Belarus. We have similar, uh, similar issues. Well, probably we are a smaller nation. So we have similar is issues going on. Uh, uh, and, and attempts of appropriation of diverse works and, and uh, figures, uh, cultural figures and, 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 uh, and, and, and territories, etc. So can you please explain what you, how do you use the word Ukrainian in this case? Thank you. I, uh, th uh, it's a very, very hard, hard question. Um, uh, I use the word Ukrainians uh, in the uh, to um, well uh, to make a point that uh, there is a uh, a tradition that starts at least uh, in the Middle Ages uh, and uh, moves uh, through the Hetmanate period to the Russian Imperial period. Uh, and uh, this tradition um, includes the tradition of uh, uh, language, uh, even if the um, people who belong to it uh, could use different languages uh, at the time. Uh, the tradition um, then um, uh, impression, the uh, idea that uh, the people who live on uh, this territory belong to uh, to this tradition, and um, that uh, this tradition includes uh, not only um, those who uh, are now calling themselves Ukrainians, but also uh, those who created uh, created 
or took part in the creation of, of this tradition. Uh, it sounds rather vague, I, I understand, but uh, what I'm trying to say is, uh, is this, uh, at least from the uh, end of the uh, 16th century, uh, uh, there is a um, tradition uh, that uh, combines uh, a number a number of people of of these lands. Uh, this tradition includes uh, language, law, um, uh, political self understanding, uh, the um, attempts to uh, be. Um, to build a self-identification uh, that um, we are those who are not uh, Polish, Russian, uh, and so on and so on. And um, from uh, even in the early 17th century, there are elements of the political nation in this tradition. Um, the, not the um, blood connections, but the connections uh, through living on, on this land and um, uh, belonging to the, uh, to the same community. Um, we can uh, name those people uh, Ukrainians uh, or uh, Ruthenians or, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, we do understand, uh, we have to understand that uh, at different points of uh, in time, they um, could have multiple uh, identities. Uh, for example, uh, one of the writers I uh, didn't have time to uh, talk about, uh, the Transcarpathian uh, poet Alex of the 19th century, Alexander Duchnovich, considered himself to be a Ruthenian, uh, a um, uh, man from uh, Austria, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and uh, the uh, member of the uh, Rus or Russia in the uh, most uh, vague sense of, of the word. Uh, so he uh, his loyalty uh, lied in the uh, in uh, Saint Petersburg, in Vienna, and in uh, in uh, Transcarpathian region. Uh, we can tell, uh, say that he's uh, Austrian, we can say that he's Ukrainian, we can say that he's uh, Russian, uh, and he re uh, really tried to write in, in Russian. And um, that it means that uh, at every point of time uh, that when we sp uh, are speaking, when we speak about uh, such figures as uh, Duchnovich or Gogol and, and so on and so on, uh, we can uh, tell, definitely tell that uh, they belong to uh, the tradition that I tried to describe and uh, to the other traditions, to the other communities, uh, communities as well. Uh, but, uh, and as uh, you well know, uh, the uh, border between the Ukrainian lang uh, literary language and the Belarusian Ukrainian language uh, in the uh, 16th, 17th centuries was uh, almost un existent. Uh, um, so the problems of identities remain, but uh, in this talk, I try to uh, put an emphasis upon uh, the um, stability of the of the tradition that, um, of course, can uh, can be uh, reconsidered and reviewed uh, in when we are speaking about when we speak about uh, the self identification of the. Ukrainians uh, in on every in every period of the history of the land. Thank you very much. Uh, and I see a question of Alexey Yevstratov about uh, the uh, the field of drama. Uh, oh, and well, uh, uh, this is the field I uh, know a little about. 
And uh, I can say that um, there were not many, uh, if uh, there were at all, um, prominent uh, Russophone uh, writers of the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian drama. Um, mainly uh, when Ukrainian theater was created, uh, modern Ukrainian theater was created in the beginning of the 18th century then for the second time at the end of the 18th century in the uh, 18 um, 19 uh, sorry beginning at the end of the 19th century uh, 1880s uh, it was the uh, Ukrainian theater the theater in Ukrainian uh, language uh, there was a demand from the uh, powers that be uh, that uh, every uh, every night, uh, the Ukrainian theaters uh, had to play plays in both in Russian and in Ukrainian. So uh, the Ukrainian writers who started started to write um, wrote in spite of uh, of this of these demands. They uh, didn't uh, in the 19th century. Uh, they didn't even try to write in uh, in Russian. Uh, with few uh, ex for the theater, and, uh, with few exceptions, such as um, Mykola Kostomarov, uh, he wrote one play in Russian uh, about uh, an ancient Rome, uh, uh, an allegory of the Tsarist Russia. Uh, and uh, then in the 20th century, I can't uh, name. Uh, a single one uh, Russophone uh, Ukrainian dramatist who uh, whose plays will uh, would be remembered uh, remembered today. I have no doubt that uh, they existed, but uh, they had uh, absolutely no influence over the Ukrainian or uh, over the Russian literature. Thank you very much. I actually have. Um what might be the last question unless we unless we have other hand mm -hmm. and my question is i hope you can hear me okay um i'm hoping to co-teach a class on post-colonial literature with someone who who works on on that topic in uh, another region another field and beyond the parallel example of the british isles the sort of the the celtic fringe that's often um described as being a parallel with the ukrainian situation um are there other uh other sort of imperial colonial relationships that you would point to um as interesting parallels with the ukrainian situation um, first of all, uh, there were uh, German, uh, the Ukrainian writers that wrote in German in the 19th century, uh, and uh, still they uh, were the part, uh, they were bilingual, and they were the part of the uh, Austrian literature and the, um, the, uh, the Ukrainian literature. Uh, uh, we can uh, Remember uh, that in the 20th century, such figures as uh, Paul Celan uh, or Bruno Schulz, who lived in, U in Ukraine also. I think uh, we can uh, find some uh, more or less analogous examples in the other literatures of the Central Europe, uh, for example, in the Czech literature. Um, I think the, um, there will be some some um, some figures. Well, we have uh, Kafka, we have Myring, and uh, and so on. And um, uh, of course, in uh, Belarusian literature, uh, for the same reason that uh, we have those writers in in Ukraine. And uh, I have no doubts there are in um, some uh, writers that uh, wrote in the imperial language, uh, but remain the part of the uh, these uh, national uh, literatures in other parts of um, of Central Europe. And uh, there were, of course, examples of the uh, anti-imperial movement. Uh, when, uh, for example, uh, the Polish writers or the Jewish writers that started to write in uh, Polish and Jewish and Yiddish, uh, 
uh, started to uh, write in Ukrainian. There, uh, there were some examples in the 18th and more in the 20th century. And uh, I think it's uh, rather interesting cases of the of uh, the anti-imperial uh, movements. Uh, there is a, a monograph of uh, Johann Petrovsky Stern uh, that had uh, the, uh, this exact name, the anti-imperial choice. Thank you very much. I think uh, since I don't see any more hands, I want to take this opportunity to thank Mikhailo very, very much for this talk. Um, thank you for joining us over Zoom. We hope that one day we'll be able to welcome you to the Jordan Center in person. Um, and thank you very much to everyone who attended the talk. Um, it was a great opening to the semester.